All right, it's Sunday. We're so excited to be with you. My name is Jake, and this is my friend Hope, and we're so honored to be two of the first people to invite you and welcome you to the Northwoods Online Experience. Yes, we're so excited to be here, and we're so excited that you're here. So why don't you jump into the chat and say hi. I'm going to be hanging out on Facebook this weekend, so I can't wait to see you. And also on Northwoods.online, we have Pastor Jason and Dave and Linda all hanging out there, and they just can't wait to meet you. And you know, we also made some updates to Northwoods.online, and we really think that these are going to serve you better and just make your experience there awesome on the weekends. But if you're looking for something or you can't find it, just go ahead and drop your question in the chat. I, I really, I liked it better when you said drop a line. Drop a line in the chat. Let them know what your needs are. It's a little old uh, school. Yeah, I'm old school. <laughs> Some people call me a boomer. But we are actually, we want to encourage you with something. We're going to talk about habits today. Well, just in this time. And so over the past half year, we've really created habits, whether we know it or not. But one thing we want you to be intentional about this year is creating a new habit of using the connection card on the Northwoods app. It's not just tracking attendance. Two of the biggest human needs are to feel loved and to feel wanted. And that's what we're trying to do through the connection card. We want you, we want to know what your needs are. We want you to know that you are our family. Yeah, that's so true. We just want to be connected and build a community. So fill that out. You know, this weekend we have Pastor Tanner with us and him and his wife, Alexa, are getting ready to plant a church. And I just can't wait to hear the message that he has today. It's all about prayer. And, you know, I think it's going to be really powerful. So why don't you pull out your phone and text a friend and invite them to watch online with you this morning. Right. It is time to get going. Worship's about to get kicked off. Our favorite hour of the week, Northwoods Online, starts right now. Yes.
No one deserves the glory but you, Jesus. Only you, with one word, can change everything. So God, do that in our hearts even now as we magnify your name and we worship you. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Thank you, Lord. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your touch. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can't do. Yes. Just one word. Lord, we do just pray for a greater measure of your power in this place. 
that you would do the things that only you can do, the things that are not too hard for you, Lord. Break down the walls, push back the dark, light of the world, move in our hearts. There's a stirring in the spirit, heaven. Something holy, can you feel it, heaven? Let your glory and your power, let your majesty and worth flood the earth, flood the earth. Let the rulers of your kingdom, let your name without reserve flood the earth, flood the earth.
your word, it declares that you are a faithful God and that you keep your covenant of love with your people for a thousand generations. I pray, Lord, that we can remember that you've been so faithful just so many generations before. And that gives us renewed faith to know that you'll continue to be faithful in our lives. Come on, let's sing this together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Faithfulness. 
Father, we thank you for the God that you are. Lord, that you love us because of who you are and not who we are. Lord, that you give us endless, everlasting love, un unconditional love. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. When times are good and times are plenty and you're walking alongside us, and thank you, God, for your faithfulness when we're walking in the valley and you're right beside us and you're pulling us along, Lord, you are a great, great God. And I'm so thankful for who you are and we glorify your name in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you guys may go ahead and be seated. Welcome to Northwoods. My name is Janine and we're so glad you've joined us today. If you would, take a second to fill out the connection card on your Northwoods app. And while you're there, we'd love for you to share any prayer requests that you might have. We'd love to partner with you in prayer as you're seeking God for the needs in your life. Well, now I need you to put on your inviting hats because next week, Pastor Nathan Rickner is going to be sharing a message about living a life fully committed to God. And he's very passionate about it. I can't wait to hear what he has to share from his heart and from God's word. So be thinking about who you can invite to come along with you next week. Well, a few years ago, Northwood started the new conference as a way for us to be refreshed and encouraged as we wrap up the summer and head into the new school and ministry year. Well, like most things in 2020, it seems, this year's conference is gonna look a little bit different but our decided outcome is gonna be the same. So on Thursday, August 13th, we hope you'll join us exclusively online as we dig deeper into the concept of, the, of word and spirit, something that Northwood's one of our core values. We'll hear keynote sessions from three statesman leaders of the Big C Church, Sam Storms, Matt Chandler, and Jack Deere. You'll hear more about these speakers and their powerful influence on Pastor Cal, Northwoods, and similar ministries throughout the world. So go ahead and register for only $20 at northwoods.church slash new 2020. Well, have you been thinking about your next steps in your walk with Jesus, but you're just not sure what they should be? Well, the Doing What Jesus Did class is a hallmark Northwoods experience, and COVID-19 is not going to stop it this year. Yeah. Registration is now open for the on-site class for the fall session here on the Peoria campus. And Doing What Jesus Did, you'll learn what it means to hear God's voice and feel his nudges, and then to walk them out with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a Northwoods favorite. And it's a great place where you can learn, grow, and build community around your group table. So sign up right now at northwoods.church slash DWJD. Or if you want more information or to talk to someone about it, we have two kiosks out on either side of the lobby. Go check it out. You're not going to want to miss this. All right, families, we have some fun and plan for you. Discovery Land has a chalk walk planned for July 31st at 6 p.m. here on the Peoria campus. It's a great place for you to show off your artistic abilities. You'll get to decorate an area with chalk. There's lots of prizes and it sounds like a ton of fun. So grab your lawn chairs, invite some friends, and join us for a beautiful summer evening with Discovery Land. You can register your family at northwoods.church slash discoveryland. Well, I have one last thing to share with you. I hope you'll hear my sincere gratitude on behalf of the leaders and the ministries of Northwoods for your continued faithful giving. We're not passing the offering bags at this time, but we have added secure offering boxes throughout the building. We've also worked hard to make sure that our online giving is simple and easy. You can go to northwoods.church give 
to check it out or check it out on your Northwoods mobile app. Well, our partnership with you brings hope and blessings to thousands of people every week. And one of the great joys of giving is being able to hear the stories of how your resources are affecting others. So if you would, please join me as we hear one of those stories of how your resources are changing the world. Well, when we talk about the idea of grander vision, what we're really saying is that God is at work in the world around us moving the gospel forward in unprecedented ways. There are people that don't know Jesus who need to. And so the, the, the value at Northwoods of, of a grander vision is that we're invested in seeing people outside of our specific context come to know Jesus. Um, and so through the, the Surge Project and also through planting regional churches, we're saying we want to partner with God in what he's doing in our world. We want to see people come to know Jesus. Jesus. The, the likelihood is if you look to your left or you look to your right and you're sitting in a Northwoods building this morning, somebody around you has declared Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their life for the very first time because of the work that God has done through Northwoods. Grander Vision is just acknowledging that it's bigger than just our specific church in our specific place. Um, and, and so we, we have this vision to plant 20 churches by the year 2030, 20 regional churches around America. And it's it's so exciting to actually get to be the first local church that's being planted right here in the Quad Cities. Um, there, there are nearly a quarter of a million people in the Quad Cities area who either don't know Jesus or who have walked away from the church. And, and so our, our heart, our vision is really to see those people, as many as we possibly can, come to know Jesus. And so we're, we're so thankful because through the Kingdom Surge, um, Northwoods has been able to invest in us to help send us and plant us here as we launch this fall. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you from us. Thank you from our team. Um, as we're moving forward, we could not do what we're doing without you. And so please know, uh, we're praying that God blesses you as you have been a blessing uh, to us and to all the church plants that are coming behind us. So thank you. Hey. Well, good morning, Northwoods. Glad to see you guys. Good to see you all. Special welcome to our, our other campuses, our friends who are joining us online. Good to see you guys this morning as well. And man, I cannot tell you how excited I am that Pathway Church is launching in the Quad Cities this fall, okay? And you guys have been an instrumental part in, in doing that. So please, yeah, you can give it up one more time. We're excited. We're looking forward to that. Now, before I go any further, first service, there was a leak in the roof on the stage behind me. And I had no idea what was going on. People down in the first row were like, what's, you know, I had so self-conscious. So like, if you're up in the balcony, if you guys have ever seen the, the movie Angels in the Outfield and there's a leak by, I need you to start giving me a signal, okay? Just let me know so that I'm not self-conscious that something else is going on, okay? Uh, but, but anyways, uh, you know, a couple things really quick. Man, there are just so many incredible stories of how God has been moving as we've stepped out in faith and we're, we're uh, looking to launch Pathway Church this fall. And so if you're interested in hearing some of those stories, some of the process, some of what the, the, the Kingdom Surge effort is going towards. I'd love to invite you, uh, if you're on the Peoria campus with us this morning, come join us down in room G, down in the basement, after service. Right after service, we'll give a little bit of an update. We'll share with you some details. Man, just really exciting stuff. Uh, as we continue in our series, Wide Awake, this morning, I just want to remind you that this, this whole series, we've been looking at how God awakens us as the church, how he moves us into a, a fresh uh, a revival of his presence. And last weekend, we heard from Pastor Keith as he shared about how impactful the power of humility can be. 
upon influencing revival in the church. So if you miss that, you can go back and catch it at northwoods.online. But this morning, I, I wanna start, we have a verse that this whole series is hinged around. So I wanna invite you, wherever you're at this morning, to read it with me right now. It's 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, And it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, this morning, as I think about those words that are our series, Wide Awake, I can't help but to think of morning workouts when I was in college as a baseball player. I'd have to wake up around 4 a.m. to get down to the, the field house to uh, do some different workouts. And uh, there, there's one morning in particular that sticks out in my mind. Because I had a friend who was very fond of pulling pranks. All right, everybody, everybody knows somebody. You've got a friend that likes to pull some pranks, right? And one of my friend's favorites was to get all of the vacuum cleaners from the whole dormitory. I think there were six of them. He would plug them all in in one hallway around 2 a.m. in the morning. He'd turn them on and run. Now listen, if you are watching this morning, don't be that guy, okay? I love my sleep. And so I would go to bed around eight or eight or nine o'clock to be ready to wake up in the morning. And so this had happened a couple times. And I was like, all right, enough's enough. And, and you guys know, if you have that friend who's a prankster, there's really only one way to get back at a prankster, right? You, you have to prank them back. And, and so we decided, some friends and I, we decided we've got to get, we've got to get back at, at our friend. And so we slowly spread the word across campus. We asked people to begin to collect apples. There's a fruit basket in the cafeteria. And so we asked them, hey, just as quietly as you can, collect apples, bring them up to my dorm room. This went on for a couple weeks. And by the end of a couple weeks, we had four or five laundry baskets full of apples like five or 600 apples. I don't know if you guys know, if you've ever been in a college men's dorm before, but there's an, there's an odor, right? <laughs> and so after a while, after a couple of weeks, this odor of a men's dormitory started to mix with the smell of rotting apples. <laughs> it was interesting. And, and eventually, you know, there's, there's, there's a way that a good prank works, all right? There's a couple key elements. What we discovered is you have to have a plan, right? You have to have secrecy, and then you, you have to execute the plan. There's the moment of surprise. There's a way a prank works. And so, so far our prank was going according to plan. We were executing the plan, there was secrecy, and the moment of surprise was approaching. So we got up around 4 a.m. one morning with all of our apples. We lugged them across the dorm. We got a mattress from a bed, took the mattress off the bed. We put it against the door frame of my friend's room, and we duct taped it in place. Now, you have to kind of picture this with me. Between the mattress and the door, which is inset in the door frame, there's about eight inches of space, just enough space to stack about 600 apples. <laughs> the key to this whole prank is my friend's door swung inwards. You guys see where this is going, all right? I know who's awake. <laughs> so I can still remember the incredibly just peculiar sound of my friend jumping up, thinking it was time for workouts, going, grabbing the door, pulling it open, only to have 600 some rotting apples avalanche down upon him. There's, there's a way a good prank works, right? And, and just like with pranks, I believe there's a way that things work inside the spiritual realm as well. We've been, we've been talking as a church about revival, about how God moves and shakes people. We've got our, our Chronicles 714 burger, okay? It's right there. Now, the only thing wrong with this burger is it needs a couple more 
pieces of meat, but that's another issue. And, and so we've been going through this, and, and, and this morning as we talk, really we're, we're centering in on a story about prayer. I believe there's a way that prayer works as well. There's a way that prayer works works. You know, we've all been in the place where we've asked God for something, right? You've been in a place before where you asked God to move in your life. And I love, I love when Charles Spurgeon talks about it. He says this, he says, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. We know we're supposed to ask for things, but sometimes You've probably run into this in your own life. It seems like simply asking isn't enough. It seems like God doesn't show up when we just ask. Church, if we want to be wide awake and prepared for God to do something new in our midst, I think we have to understand that there's a way prayer works. And while there's a way that prayer in general or just the idea of communicating with God, that's a separate topic, there's a way that works. There's also a way that the type of prayers we're talking about this morning, the prayers we pray when we need God to move in our lives and do something, those miracle-inducing prayers, hope-driven prayers in desperate situations, there's a way those prayers work too. Some of you will remember Pastor Cal shared with us a few weeks ago about the idea of positioning ourselves for God to move, that that God is a quarterback, right? And he's throwing a pass, and we as the church have to put ourselves in a position to be there when the football arrives. I think in the exact same way, there's a way that we can position ourselves for an answered prayer. So this morning, I I wanna pull out some principles. I wanna give you some boxes that you can check to position yourself for an answered prayer. So let's take a look at our story in 2 Chronicles 20 and begin with a little bit of context. There's a man named Jehoshaphat, a king, who is king over the southern nation of Israel called Judah. And if you read through the Old Testament, you will find that there is a repeated pattern of good kings and bad kings. The King Jehoshaphat, who is the star of our story, is generally thought of as one of the good kings. If we go look in 2 Chronicles 20, 32, it tells us that he walked in the way of his father and did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And this is important. Jehoshaphat turned the nation of Judah back to God. That's the context that our story occurs in this morning, the context of following God's plan. Second Chronicles 20 verse one reads like this. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Muonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazon, Tamar, that is, and Gedi. Now, I need to pause here for just a moment, and I need to say thank you. Thank you to Pastor John, who put this series together for giving me the section with all the hard words, all right? Come on, John. (laughs) The Moabites and the Ammonites are pagan nations that have set themselves against the God of Israel, and they've come to destroy a people that God has a plan for. So I want you to catch this. The the context in this scenario, the story, the context of this answered prayer is a good king following a good God, and then evil interjects. Good king following a good God, and then evil interjects. Why is this important? (laughs) Many of us miss the fact that the context of our prayers are the same. You see, we're children of God. We're serving that same good God. We're uh, we're living out the plan God has uh, for the redemption of mankind, not just for us, there's a plan, and evil has interjected in your life. It exists. 
That's our context. When it comes to positioning ourselves for an answered prayer, box number one is to understand your context. We have to understand the context we're praying in because it shapes everything about prayer. It shapes what we pray for, it shapes how we pray for it, and it shapes the outcomes of our prayers. You've gotta understand the context. But for many of us, this is a challenge. Why? Because when we're praying, we're praying into situations, we're praying into our finances, we're praying into our sicknesses, we're praying into our jobs, we're praying into our relationships. What we're really doing is we're praying into the things we see in front of us. We're praying into our circumstances. And we forget our context. And what happens because we fail to understand the context we're praying in catch this, is we blame God for the circumstances of our lives. Some of you are holding a God who loves you more than anything in the world accountable for an unanswered prayer because you don't understand your context. I want you to hear my heart when I say this because I love you and there's some people with us this morning who really need to hear this. Do not evaluate the love of God by the events of your life. Do not evaluate the love of God by the events of your life. When we do this, we forget the context in which we find ourselves. We forget that sin has enter, entered our world, that, that evil has interjected into the context we're praying in. Do not evaluate the love of God by the events of your life. And catch this, this is the, the important follow-up. When you're tempted to do so, because you're going to be, Instead, evaluate the love of God by the events of his life. God did not fail to answer your prayer in these current circumstances by failing to address the evil in your life. God addressed the evil, uh, the, the evil in your life through the person, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how God addressed your circumstances. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's the gospel. God didn't fail to answer your circumstances. But if we're being honest, Satan has broken the prayer life of some people with us this morning. He's broken it because he has convinced you that if God doesn't answer your prayers in the way you expect him to, that means he doesn't care about you. Satan has convinced you that if you remain cynical towards God and unexpectant when you pray, what you're doing is that you're protecting yourself from not getting the circumstances you want. Church, I wanna encourage you I want you to hear this, cynicism is a setup. Cynicism is a setup. When Satan has you convinced that God's not gonna answer your prayers and so you just pray, ah, you know, God, it'd be nice if this happened. He's really convinced you to pray without faith. Why would we pray without faith? That's the point of prayer. Your context is a spiritual battlefield. I wanna remind you, of Jesus' words in Matthew 10, 16 to his disciples. Some of you will remember this. He says, I am sending you out like sheep amongst the what? The wolves. Your context is a battlefield. We tend to forget that our lives are more purposed than we could ever dare dream because we serve a God who has commissioned us for that purpose and sent us into the world but you've got an enemy. Let me, let me help you understand the type of prayer I'm talking about this morning. When we're praying for God to do something, when we're praying miracle-inducing prayers, I would define prayer this way. Prayer is partnership with purpose. Prayer is partnership with purpose purpose, which brings us to box number two. When we're positioning ourselves for an answered prayer, we have to check our intentions. <laughs> 
We've got to check our intentions. If the context that we're praying in is to advance the kingdom of God in the face of the greatest enemy mankind has ever known, then some of us, we need to start changing the things we're praying for, don't we? You've got to check your intentions. In Jehoshaphat's context, he is praying and interceding, not just for himself, but for the nation and the purposes of God. Far too many of us operate with the functional understanding that prayer is simply asking God to do things for us. That if we ask nicely enough, with the right words said in just the right way, God might show up and answer our prayers. But when it comes to positioning yourself for an answered prayer, your intentions matter. I want to free some of you of a fear you might have this morning. If I had to guess, if I asked you to raise your hand, my guess is about half of the people watching right now would raise their hand if I asked the question, are you afraid to pray in public? I'm not going to ask that question because the people who are afraid to pray in public aren't going to raise their hands in public either, okay? (laughs) But if I asked, my guess is about half the hands would go up. I think there are probably quite a few people who are afraid because you're, you're nervous, you fear that you might say the wrong thing, that you might interrupt this holy moment with God, that you might not have the right words to say, that someone might hear you, and, and you're struggling with that, that fear. But I, I want you to know, church, you can pray right or you can pray wrong, but you can never pray better or worse. You can never pray better or worse. So many people that I've encountered operate with the mindset that some people are better prayers because they know more Bible words or they know more scripture. But Matthew 6, 8 tells us that our Father knows what we need before we ask him. Let me ask you a question. If God knows what you need before you ask him, do you think he he really cares about how you ask him about what words you use, or about why you're asking him. We need to check our intentions because God doesn't answer wording. He answers hearts. God wants to answer your heart. Intentions matter because they affect outcomes. Now, if I can, if I can help you understand what I'm talking about this morning, how many people know what this is? Anybody? Anybody know what this is? Come on, somebody, what is it? That's a lottery ticket, right? Yeah, I've never bought one of these before. Uh, I I guess it could be a little frowned upon. Uh, I'd also guess that there's never probably been a lottery ticket purchased for a sermon before. You know, you go into the guy at the counter, you're like, "Uh, hey, you know, you you know, pick a winner. I'm like, no, I'm I'm buying this for an illustration. It's for a church. And he's like, yeah, uh uh-huh, for a church. (laughs) That's why I didn't buy it. I sent my little brother and my little sister, and one of them got it and the other one paid for it so I got to pay them back but some of us some of us pray like people play the lottery we hope that if we we string together the right words if we if we come up with the right phrases if we throw up a prayer here and there when we have the the time that that just like the lottery if we pray in the right way we might get lucky That's not what prayer is. Your intentions matter. They matter. You see, the goal of of lottery ticket prayers isn't to participate in God's plan. It's to get comfortable inside of our own. Ouch. We've got to check our intentions. If I could give you a quick test for your intentions this morning, it would be this. How many of your prayers are about you? How many of your prayers center around your needs and your wants and your desires? It might be time to check your intentions. You guys ever gone into somebody's house before and they got a Bible verse up on the wall? You know, the most popular one, the one I run into all the time is, is what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Or you go in and, and somebody's got John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, yada, yada. That's, that sounds bad. I shouldn't have said it like that. 
But I've never seen Jeremiah 17, 9 on somebody's wall before. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Why not throw that up on your kitchen wall? I don't know, just a thought. I haven't seen that one before. God's word measures us and it finds our hearts wanting. And if that's true, we have to check our intentions. Now, I wanna be careful here. I don't want you to hear me saying that God doesn't care about you, that he doesn't wanna bless you, that he's not going to provide for you, that he might not give you good gifts just for the sake of bestowing his favor upon you. God does those things, but that's not the foundation for the type of prayer we're talking about. Sometimes we have to check our intentions. If prayer is really partnership with a purpose, then we have to acknowledge it's God who chooses the purpose. God chooses the purpose. If we go back to King Jehoshaphat, you see that he understands his context, he's got the right intentions, but that doesn't change the situation he's in. We know from an an earlier part of 2 Chronicles that the the Moabites and the Ammonites, the army that's coming against them, significantly outnumber the army of Judah. I'm guessing they might have been two to one odds. There might have been as many as two million soldiers marching against the nation of Judah. And, and, And scripture tells us they're at a place called En Gedi, so they're probably only a day's march away. And trapped on one side by the Mediterranean Sea, the other side by the Dead Sea, the Moabites and the Ammonites, live north. There's nowhere to run. Jehoshaphat knows his options are limited and he needs a miracle. I love what the author of Chronicles records next. Sometimes the the Bible is just chocked full of these significant, deep, poetic statements. He says, then Jehoshaphat was afraid. (laughs) Understatement of the century, right? (laughs) But what comes next is what we're looking for. Jehoshaphat was afraid and he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Listen to this, because some of you need to hear this this morning. Jehoshaphat's first reaction is fear. But his first response is prayer. There's a difference between your reaction and your response. It's okay to be human. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to doubt in a moment. But how do you respond? How did Jehoshaphat respond? He felt fear, but where did fear drive him? It drove him to God. I want you to hear some of Jehoshaphat's prayer this morning. Verse 6. He prays, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? (laughs) You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Verse 12, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes... Our eyes are upon you. Box number three, when we're positioning ourselves for an answered prayer, we need to fix our eyes on the Father. You need to fix your eyes. It reminds me of some uh, some places where Jesus is described as praying. In Mark 6 and John 11, both places say, Jesus looked up to heaven. He looked up to heaven. Most of us are so busy closing our eyes in humility when we pray that we forget the most powerful position of prayer is to fix our eyes upon the Father, the author and sustainer and creator of all things. I love the way John Eldridge describes what Jesus was doing in his book, Moving Mountains. He says he looks up to heaven to fix his attention on his father's loving face. And then this line is so good. He is orienting himself to what is most true in the world. I've, I've grown up my whole life as a, as a baseball fan. Actually, I'm, I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan. 
Nobody, man, every time, every time, I'm just waiting. There's actually a guy in first service. I had one, one other Reds fan. I've always said, you know, being a Reds fan is great because nobody really seems to mind us that much. But, but the bad part of it is they don't mind us very much because we're never very good. Uh, and, and so I grew up as a, as a Reds fan and my family, we would go to, to Reds games pretty often. And, and you know, the thing that kept me going through my childhood as a Cincinnati Reds fan was always this one thought, at least, at least, I'm not a Cardinals fan. <laughs> We're the, yeah, okay, that was about 50%, that's all the Cubs fans, they're clapping, so. Yeah, I, I, I grew up going to Reds games, and, and around the age of five, my life changed very drastically. Because when I was five, some of you know this, I have, I have four siblings, I have an older brother. When I was around five years old, I, I had, my younger siblings were born. Keyword, siblings, with an S, plural. I have two younger brothers and a sister who are triplets. Now, for those of you who don't understand the concept of triplets, that means three babies. Like, not three kids, like three babies at one time. And then three toddlers, and then three kids running around screaming, and then whatever the next stage is after that, I don't know. But we had, we had triplets, and so uh, what was unique about going to Reds games was the way with the triplets that, that we transported them when we were younger. I, I just had, uh, my, my wife and I had our firstborn son, Dane, about three months ago. He's adorable, chonky little boy. And, and when we take him to places, we've got, a, we've got a stroller, right? We've got a little off-roading stroller. You can do stuff with it and hop curbs. And, and you guys have seen like the, the twin strollers, like the side-by-side. -side. Anybody got twins in here? Nobody? Twins, really? You guys, are, oh, you guys are twins. Yeah, so you guys were in like a side-by-side -side stroller. We didn't have a side-by-side, -side. we had an arc, okay? Like, you know the boat for no, yeah. The, the stroller for the triplets was like bam, 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 one after another, it was like 20 feet long, and you could use it in the ballpark to like mow people over. You'd be going through, somebody makes you mad. <laughs> oh, my leg! You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay? So when we were navigating the ballpark, we had a very specific order. My dad, my dad would go first. He'd always be wearing a Johnny Bench jersey, say Bench number five. Some of you guys know who that is, greatest catcher in the game of baseball, I said it. And so I, you know, my dad would go first and then my older brother and I would come after my dad. My mom would follow with the tank. And, and we would go around the stadium and when you're navigating a ballpark, what's interesting, there's, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of sights, sounds, smells. You're going to buy a $20 hot dog, a $30 soda, a $45 box of popcorn. And as you're going around as a little kid, it's pretty easy to get lost. But I knew as long as I kept my eyes on the back of my dad's jersey, I was gonna get where I needed to go. As long as I could see Johnny Bench number five, I would get where I was supposed to be. Why? Because my dad knew what he was doing. He knew where he was supposed to go. And I trusted him. <laughs> you see, when we fix our eyes on our heavenly father, we're really reminding ourselves who we're following. We're reminding ourselves who we're praying to. I think when Jehoshaphat is proclaiming, when he's praying, he's talking about how great God is, he's gonna tell God what he needs, right? But before he does that, he reminds himself who he's praying to. Some of us need to fix our eyes on the Father because we need reminded of the God we're praying to. We need to orient ourselves to the truth of who God is. Let me, let me ask you a question this morning. When you are praying to God, when you're asking him to do something in your life, what does he look like? It's an interesting question. When you picture God, when you're coming before him, asking him to work a miracle, to shift the realities around you, how do you see him? Is he the incredible, all-powerful sustainer and creator of all life who has blessed you, has given birth to you, has put you in this world, has given you purpose? 
Is he the, the God who can shift realities in ways that you can't even imagine outside of time and space? Is he the God of miracles or is he your last second backup plan? How big's your God? I think it makes a difference when we're praying. You need to orient yourself to what is most true, not the circumstances of your your situation, but the God who's leading you through them. We need to fix our eyes on the Father. There's more to the story, though. (laughs) Some of you guys are like really excited. You're like, man, this is great. And some of you are like, Tanner, this is stupid. (laughs) Like, that's all common sense. Great, but what do I actually do? Like, I want my prayers to be answered. So how do I go about getting my my prayers answered, okay? Lottery ticket. Context, intention, fix your eyes. And then Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat has his prayer answered. See, God answers him. A prophet named Jehaziel speaks on God's behalf. He says these words, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of some words I don't know how to say, and you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, Judah and Jerusalem. Now, I want to make sure, sometimes when we're reading a story in the Bible, we can distance ourselves from the story. I want to make sure we understand what's actually going on here, okay? So you think back, you remember, Jehoshaphat, uh, there's a giant army of probably a couple million people coming to kill them, right? They want to kill them. That's what battle is. That's what war is. And Jehoshaphat prays, and Jehoshaphat has his prayers answered through this guy named Jehaziel. And Jehaziel, what he tells him to do, he says, God's answer is this, hey, like, I've got this, I'm gonna take care of it, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your prayer. But what I want you to do, okay, this is funny, like, what I want you to do, Jehoshaphat, is get all your people together, and then I want you to go get really, really, really close to the people who wanna kill you. <laughs> Just, like, hang out next to them, and I'm gonna take care of it. I want you to imagine knowing that the odds are stacked against you and God's instructions, God's words are hold your position. Box number four, when we're positioning ourselves for an answered prayer is hold your position. This is the, the, the peace for all the doers in the room, all the people who want to know, how do I influence God to make him answer my prayers? See, there's an interesting dichotomy in God's economy. Sometimes God will ask you to do everything that you can do only to bring you to the place where there's nothing left for you to do so that you have to rely on him. Holding the position is trusting the plan God has laid in front of you. At the end of the day, holding the position is an acknowledgement that you are not God. (laughs) It's the hardest part about prayer. It's the enduring faithfulness to say, your will be done in my life. It's asking God to mend a marriage through supernatural forgiveness because you've done everything else you can do. It's it's asking God to break an addiction because you've tried every other method. It's, It's seeking providence when you need God to provide because you've tried everything else you can think of. It's holding the position and trusting to the plan God has called you to. What do we do when we've all we've we've done all we can? We we hold the position God's called us to. Some of you are in that space right now. Some of you have been holding a position for a long time. Some of you are are circling a family member in prayer because they don't know Jesus and you've been praying for years and years for the Holy Spirit to come and work on their heart. 
Some of you are, are holding the position because you're praying circles around a sickness and illness in your family that you have been struggling with for years and God doesn't seem to be showing up and doing what he said he was gonna do. Some of you are, are holding the position with, uh, with a child. You're a single parent and, and you are trying to figure out how do I do this? It's just getting harder. Some of you are holding the position in so many different ways and you're just asking the question, why hasn't God moved yet? Why did he answer Jehoshaphat's prayer and not mine? <laughs> what do I do? There's, there's one more piece to Jehoshaphat's story. And I almost didn't share it with you because I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. So I want to make very sure I'm clear that this is a principle, not a certainty. But there is biblical and experiential precedence for this final box. If we go back to verse 20, Jehoshaphat and the army are on their way to confront the armies of the enemy, outnumbered two to one, and resting on the words of God. And Jehoshaphat speaks these words. Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Do you hear it? Jehoshaphat is calling them to hold the position. But then he goes a step further. Verse 21, and when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and said, give thanks to God for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. It's the answered prayer Jehoshaphat has been waiting on, but, but did you hear it? I want you to catch two incredibly important words. They're holding the position. They've marched out. The army is going to meet where God has told them to be. They're outnumbered two to one, and they're doing what God has called them to do. And then these incredibly, two, uh, these incredibly important two words in verse 22, they say this, and when, and when they began to sing and praise, God shows up. I want to be careful here because I don't want you to hear me saying that every time you thank God for something, he's going to do it. There's been four other boxes, and again, we're positioning ourselves for God to move, not guaranteeing that he will, but there is a spiritual principle to praising God in advance for what you are trusting and believing he is going to do in your life. Box number five, sometimes when we're positioning ourselves for an answered prayer, we've got to praise God in advance for what he's going to do. I told you earlier that I'm so excited that Pathway Church is being planted this fall in the Quad Cities. So many things that, that happen when, when a church gets planted, but one of the biggest things, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, where's the church gonna be at? Where's the building? And, and, and We've been working on that for so long. We've been searching for close to five months, running down leads, checking in with contacts, looking at different spaces, flexing the budget. Spot after spot didn't work out. This spot was too small. There wasn't enough parking here. This spot uh, didn't have the right height ceilings. And the biggest thing we kept running into over and over again was this spot is too expensive. <laughs> All the while in my, my prayer journal, I had outlined a few things that I've been specifically asking God for. One of those things is that God would provide a free meeting space for Pathway Church. Not a cheap one, a free one. Church, church isn't about the building, the building's a tool, but I didn't want our church to have to spend a huge chunk of our budget on a building space when we could be spending it on seeing people come to know Jesus. And so I was circling as often as I could, God, would you provide a free space for us to meet and worship in? And, and I'll tell you, 
The longer the process went on, the more Satan started to whisper into my ear. As this door would close and that door would close, I start to hear that voice. You've heard it before. For me, it went like this. Tanner, Tanner, you moved your family here. You moved your wife and your little, your little baby. You, you moved him here. What's gonna happen? Tanner, you, 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 said, you, know, you said you were gonna honor me. You were gonna plant a church and you can't even find a building? Tanner, you've got this, this group of people, this awesome launch team that God has put together, people who are counting on you, trusting you to lead, and, and you can't even figure out where we're gonna meet at? Those are the lies I started to hear, the cynicism Satan was whispering into my life. And one day, one day I was, I was reading a book and it started to talk about this principle of praising God in advance for what he's gonna do. And so I can take you back to two dates in my prayer journal. I can take you back to the date I wrote out, God, would you provide a free space for us? And then I can take you back to the date where I wrote, God, I'm praising you in advance for the place you're preparing for us. <laughs> and then, when I started to praise God, I got a call, I got, a, I got connected with a guy that comes here to this church in Peoria, this campus. He said, hey, hey, I know this church in the Quad Cities, I think you should get connected with them. So we, we got connected with them and, and we started to find out this, this church has been declining for a long time, they've been struggling been trying to remain faithful to what God's doing, but they've been having a hard time. And, and, and as things progressed and we had conversations and we moved forward, last weekend we took the first step in a process, listen to this church, that this group of people wants to give their building to Pathway Church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when? begin to praise. I, I, I wish I could tell you that that's where the story ended, but it actually gets better. Because as I'm connecting with this group of people, some of these, these faithful saints who have been here for a long time, working so hard, trying to figure out what to do, uh, there's one family in particular that has been there since the church was founded almost 50 years ago. She starts to tell me this story. She says, the week that, that you called us, the week we got in touch, our group of about 10 or 15 got together for a Bible study and we realized this can't keep going in the direction that's going. We need, we need to do something. And so the week that we got in contact with them was the same week on a Thursday, they decided as a group to pray one word. That Saturday is when we touched base. I wanna tell you something, church. I can't prove this, but I believe in my heart that all the time we were waiting and, and trying and, and seeking and asking and praying and all those lies that Satan was trying to whisper into my ear, all those doubts, all those questions, all of that time, God was delaying an answer, not because he didn't want to provide what I had asked for, but because he wanted to answer two prayers at once. Sometimes that's how God works. <laughs> and when. Now, what's interesting, what's fun, what's great is that now I'm starting to praise God in advance for some other things I'm trusting him to do. <laughs> starting to praise God in advance for hundreds of people to come to know Jesus at Pathway Church. I'm starting to praise God in advance for marriages to be restored, for generations to worship him together, for addictions to be overcome, for people who do not currently have a seat in the kingdom to walk into what Jesus has put on their life and say, Lord, I trust you, I place faith in your name, and I'm starting to praise God in advance for the work that he's gonna do. <laughs> and some of you are in a place right now in your lives where you need to do the same thing. 
You've got some areas in your life you've been praying around for a long time. There's some circumstances that won't shift. Some things you need to change. And, and church, you need to start to praise God in advance for what you're trusting him to do. And so I wanna, I wanna invite you right now. We're gonna just enter a moment of prayer. I wanna invite you to assume whatever, whatever position you can before the throne of God. Find the place that you speak to Jesus best in. And right now I wanna lead you in, in a time of prayer. Father, God, creator, sustainer, provider of all things. There are some people in this room this morning. There are some people watching online. There are some people at our, our Galesburg campus, our Canton campus, our Chillicothe campus. God, there are people right now who have been doing the things you've been calling them to do. They have been holding the position. They've been chasing down your purpose for their life. And God, they are ready for a moment of breakthrough. Father, there's some people in this room right now who have people in their lives who don't know Jesus, and God, we are praising you in advance that they are gonna come to know him. God, there's some sicknesses in our church right now. There's cancer. Father, there are aching backs that need healed right now, and we're praising you in advance for what you're gonna do. God, there are some families that have been broken by Satan. There are some, some children who need reunited with parents. There are some marriages that need restored, and we're praising you in advance, Father, that you're gonna do that. God, there are some people sitting here in this room right now who are, are young men and women who you have placed a calling on their lives, and they're looking for it. And God, we're praising you in advance that you're gonna connect them with what they're gonna do in the kingdom of God. Father, we are praising you in advance because you know all things and you love us in ways we can't even imagine or comprehend. And so God, we're praising you in advance for what you're gonna do in our lives. So Father, we cling to that promise we cling to the promise that Jesus is enough for us and that regardless of all things, as we ask you to move in our lives, you already have. And we praise you in advance for the things that you're gonna do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, God bless you guys as you go this morning. I just want to invite you one more time. If you'd like to hear more about what Northwoods is doing through Pathway, through our, our Surge project, come join us in room G down in the basement. I'd love to meet you guys. I'd love to share with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend, all right?